So Dr. Scholz, today we're taking questions on radiation from our YouTube comment section. And one of the patients asked how, first of all, this is kind of a general question. They were wondering when somebody receives radiation, if the entire prostate is eradicated or affected. So they're kind of wondering how the radiation affects the tissue. Yeah, good question, comes up a lot. And uh, the uh, example I use is people are also familiar that women with breast cancer go through uh, radiation to the breast and uh, they, treat the whole breast uh, with a certain amount of radiation, and then they treat the tumor with a larger amount. And when men have prostate radiation, they have their whole prostate treated. As a general rule, there are uh, some focal things going on, but that's outside the mainstream. We are all, all well aware that the when the whole breast is treated, the breast doesn't disappear. We don't vaporize the, a woman's breast when she goes through radiation therapy. So this is the same for men who have their prostates radiated. Their prostate remains intact. And uh, the function of the gland, which is to make fluid for uh, semen, is, um, is greatly diminished after radiation. But the prostate gland is still there, and it can still make some PSA. The impact of the radiation actually is often felt rather slowly over a period of many months. So. Sometimes people go through radiation and expect their PSA levels to plummet to zero immediately, which is uh, not really typical. It can happen, but usually the PSA will float down slowly over a period of many months, sometimes more than a year. So the prostate remains intact, and the impact on what we're monitoring, the PSA levels, can oftentimes be delayed. Does the radiation, when somebody radiates the prostate, extend to like the lymph nodes? How is the radiation field uh, measured? So it depends on how uh, concerned people are about that individual's situation for spread outside the gland. And uh, it can be done either way. So I, I mentioned uh, briefly that uh, you can even do focal radiation to a section of the gland, although this is considered experimental. More typically, the prostate itself is treated in its entirety with a margin of five to seven millimeters around the whole prostate. But it is also possible to extend the radiation not only from the prostate, but out into the surrounding lymph nodes where the cancer often will spread in its early stages. Interestingly, the side effects with modern well-performed radiation for treating lymph nodes, which is a bigger field, is less than the potential side effects from simply treating the prostate. And that's because of the sensitive structures that are in and around the prostate. The urethra, which goes right through the middle of the gland, the rectum, which is close by, and the, and the bladder, which is close by, and the nerves for erections, which are very close by. Studies have shown that with modern IMRT, you can uh, give radiation to the lymph nodes with really no additional side effects beyond the type of side effects you'll get when you treat the prostate. So it is uh, at least side effects that are um, you, know, you may have a little bit more fatigue, but it's not something that they can pick up on quality of life studies. So when it comes to you know radiation and PSA decline, how should the PSA decline after radiation versus radiation with hormone therapy? Yeah, so hormone therapy, people have usually underestimate the power of hormone therapy. Back in the uh, late 1990s, uh, when, in my opinion, radiation was scary bad, and uh, we didn't use radiation for prostate cancer back in that era, uh, we would give men hormone therapy as primary treatment. And it would almost universally cause the PSA to go down to zero quite rapidly and stay at zero as long as the hormone therapy was continued. It has not uh, become a mainstream uh, standalone treatment because once the hormone therapy is stopped, the cancer will slowly come back in most people. It doesn't cure the disease, but it controls it beautifully and can maintain control for over 10 years really quite quite easily. So when you give radiation and hormone therapy together, as I mentioned before, radi PSAs tend to drift down slowly with radiation alone. But if you give radiation plus hormone therapy, the PSAs will plummet rapidly down to low levels, usually less than 0.1 within uh, three to four months. And uh, there have been studies showing actually that if you give radiation and hormone therapy together and the PSA doesn't drop quickly to 0.1 after three or four months, 
that those are the people that are going to be at higher risk for future relapses. So we have a patient who originally has plans for combination therapy. So they're going to get seeds and then beam radiation as well as ADT. And then on the pathology report, it came back that they have a ductal carcinoma. And now the doctor's saying just to do surgery. And so they'd like to know your thoughts on that. Obviously, it's a big change. Well, I'm not a fan of surgery really under any circumstances. The implication is somehow that the surgery is more efficacious just because I guess the concern that the cancer is a little more aggressive because it's ductile. Uh, that um, is, in my mind, completely irrelevant. Uh, the issue is what's most likely to cure you and what's least likely to harm you. Well, and when you put those criteria forward, it's almost never going to be, let's do surgery. So um, uh, the ideal surgical candidate, if someone just feels like they got to have an operation before they, they go on to the next life, would probably be a man with a high intermediate risk where you could be very confident that you're not going to have positive margins after the surgery. When people are tr uh, selecting treatment, they want a one and done type of a uh, methodology. They don't want to have operation and then find, oh, we didn't get it all, now we're going to give you radiation. Uh, the, uh, the idea is to pick the best treatment up front and if it's selected and uh, appropriately and if you have high quality people doing it, cure rates are going to be very high, even with the more aggressive types of cancer. So I don't understand that logic at all. So this is a question we get quite often, especially with how much we talk about radiation. Patients want to know how to assess the right radiation center. So what are the qualifications that they should be looking for in choosing a center? That's very difficult to know. It's not just the center, but it's the doctors within the center. And um, I think it's uh, important to go online and look at references, uh, pick reputable centers. Uh, if you have a physician, a uh, family doctor, or a urologist that's been referring repeatedly to a center and seeing good results, that's, uh, in other words, an independent observer of their outcomes, I think all these things come into play uh, in just making these decisions. It's like anything else, trying to pick a good electrician or a good plumber, uh, word of mouth, uh, it's it's not, um, it's not easy to know uh, as people are just coming into this field for the first time, you know, who's really good at doing this, who's average and who's below average. But it does matter. And every effort should be made to try and figure out who's really tops because you get one chance to get this right. Uh, the radiation is a permanent choice. Thanks so much for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer and all sorts of education, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer education videos every week.